everyone. It's great that you could join with us today as we celebrate the greatest event in human history, one that has changed the destiny of millions of people over thousands of years, most of whom we've never met, some that we have, a few that we know really well, and ourselves, for whom this is deeply personal. I love this time of year. I look forward to nature springing into life again after the dormant winter season, especially this our magnolia tree that I'm standing beside. The buds are just beginning to open, but I've been expecting it. It's no surprise it happens every year. The life appears from apparent deadness. But the first Easter was unique. No one was expecting new life from the grave. Even though Jesus had told them clearly he would be rising from the dead. This was amazing, stunning. It was unexpected. This was a new kind of life that would now be available for all who believe and would turn the world upside down forever. Let's begin our service with prayer, and then we'll praise God in the words of the song, He is Risen. Let's pray. God of promise and God of hope, through your great mercy, have granted us new birth through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We praise your wonderful, wonderful name. God of glory and God of might, who through your great power have granted us new strength to endure all things through faith in Christ our risen King. We praise your wonderful name.
Two people, moving and marching, thinking, head scratching about something big that's just been happening. But on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem Way, two became three as another says, Hey, hey, says he, you've been thinking and head scratching. Has something big just been happening? <gasps> you've not heard about what's been happening? All of Jerusalem have been head scratching. What have I missed? asks the man. I'd love to know. Please tell if you can. It's about a man called Jesus and we thought he was coming to rescue God's people and send the Romans off running. He did and he said loads of cool stuff from a place up north called Nazareth. He told great stories and healed the sick. He knew people by name and what made them tick. Oh, remember that wedding? He turned water to wine, brought his friend back to life and his friend felt just fine. He was sharing and caring, just ask his friend Pete. He walked on the water with only his feet. He said shush to the storm and the storm was hushed. He did a miracle with bread and thousands were stuffed. Besides all this, his sermon up a hill had so many stories, super cool and brill. I can't believe it. What a big loss. A man so great who hung on a cross and on that cross, that's where he died. I feel so tied up in knots inside. And three days have passed, though it feels more like seventy, because now we've heard that his tomb is empty. <laughs> That's right, you heard me. His body is gone. But who'd take his body? He never did wrong. You seem confused and out of the picture. So let me show you what it says in the scripture. It was always the plan, right from the start, because Jesus loves you with all of his heart. He died on the cross, but rose from the tomb. He came back to life so you can live too. And as they were moving, and still head scratching, two of them stopped, but the third kept on marching. Uh, hey, uh, don't go, please, the two say. The sun's gone to bed, so why don't you stay? Good point, says the third. Day has turned to night. I'll stop over with you two and then grab a bite. And as they sit down to eat, they close their eyes. He thanks God for the grub, then what a surprise! The two people stare and then rub their eyes. It's Jesus, not gone, but fully alive! And before they say seconds, there's more bread going round. Jesus just vanishes. He cannot be found. The two are left thinking and really head scratching. They'd just been with Jesus. Something big was happening. We must say we've seen Jesus, so tie up your shoes. Quick to Jerusalem, there's no time to lose. All along it was Jesus, the very same one. They were searching the scriptures with God's precious son. It's the biggest story that's ever been told about Jesus who's risen and never gets old. The two met with Jesus in the most surprising way. They shared the story and we still share it today. Good morning and a very happy Easter to you. Today, we're gonna to look at the events that took place on that road. The road to Emmaus where two became three. But of course, these two disciples didn't realize the third person walking with them was Jesus. That Jesus is alive, that he had conquered over sin and death. We're gonna track the events as Jesus opens up the scriptures and helps them to understand that all scripture had been pointing to him. Him as the one who would redeem and rescue the whole world. We're gonna look at the events that took place around that table as they broke bread. And then the disciples' eyes were open to see who Jesus really was. And we're going to see that these two disciples who were mourning are now running down the road, telling their friends that Jesus is alive. One thing I've done a lot more during this year of lockdown than I've done in previous years is enjoyed a good story. And I particularly enjoy a good story that runs through a film narrative. As a family, we've been revisiting the MCU, that's the Marvel Cinematic Universe, in which we've been following the accounts and the stories of these isolated superheroes and how they've been seeking to defend the world and the universe from a threat. But it's interesting watching them for the second, third and fourth time is, as you watch these isolated movies, you see that they all interconnect with one another because there's a bigger narrative going on. 
as they seek to rise up against the biggest threat there is against the world, and ultimately the universe, and seek to save the world. Well, the MCU is similar to really what's going on in this passage today. Because Jesus helps these disciples to see that all these isolated stories from Moses to David to Joseph to Esther, the prophets, that they're all interconnected. They're all pointing to one person and that person is Jesus. Wow, what it must have been like to be with the disciples that day as Jesus opened up the scriptures, but more importantly, opened up their eyes to see just who he is. I can only imagine what stories he chose to tell. As Jesus opened the scriptures with these disciples, I wonder if he chose to reveal himself through Moses. Moses, who was led by God to take the Israelites out of captivity under the oppression of Egypt, through the parted seas, into the wilderness, then for Joshua to take them into the promised land. Through that account, did he help them to see that he was the one who came into the world to free us from our oppressor, sin and death, and to take us into the promised new Jerusalem. Did he choose to reveal himself through Abraham and Isaac, a father who willingly was prepared to give up his son on an altar to be sacrificed, only for God to provide a male sheep to be sacrificed in his place? Did Jesus choose to reveal himself through that as the, the one by whom his father had sent him to be the lamb of God that would be slain for the sins of the world? Did he choose to reveal himself through David, a young boy who would battle a giant, the oppressor that came against their people? and in th with three stones struck him down. Did Jesus choose to reveal himself through that as the one who would take down our oppressor, our enemy, but instead of three stones, he took three nails himself to defeat our enemy. Regardless of what stories Jesus chose to share with these disciples, the reality with each one, he was revealing that he was the true and better one. He was the true and better Moses, the true and better Abraham and Isaac, the true and better David. But with each one, these disciples were with the true and better one as he was explaining who he is to them. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story, every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed a test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out, not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac, the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserved so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There is a true and better Joseph who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in a gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses who, struck with the rod of God's justice, now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David whose victory becomes his people's victory though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, 
who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. There was a true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points to one person, Jesus. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
King of Kings. Luke, chapter 24, verse 28 to 32. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if we were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, as he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Just imagine how those disciples on the road to Emmaus felt as they reflected on the previous day's events. They had been in Jerusalem and had quite possibly spoken to Jesus' 12 disciples who had been with him in the upper room the evening before he had been so cruelly killed. I wonder what the topic of conversation had been. Would have been about all the dreams and aspirations they had, their hopes for what Jesus would do, hopes that were now seemingly dashed. Did the 12 disciples describe that final meal with Jesus? Did Matthew recount the words he later recorded in his gospel? The ones written here in the first person, as if Matthew were saying them himself. In Matthew 26, he wrote, While we were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to us, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to us, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. I wonder what they were thinking about these words now. Did they believe that this was how Jesus wanted them to remember him? When Paul wrote about the same meal to the Corinthian church, he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Was this event to be one that was to be remembered nostalgically, looking back to the good old days, as we would remember a memory or a relation or a friend who had died? Perhaps that was what Jesus wanted them to do, to look back and just to think about him. But now something incredible has happened in Emmaus. Jesus is with them. He's the one that's breaking the bread again. He's the one that's giving it to them. No longer is this purely a nostalgic moment about the past. This is present reality. Jesus is right there with them. The phrase, do this in remembrance of me, takes on a very different meaning. As Matthew records at the end of his gospel, where Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is present now and forevermore. That promise remains even to today. So as we take this communion, Let's remember three things. One, that it is rooted in the past, an actual event that happened that we're celebrating today, where Jesus, the Son of God, humbled himself and offered himself as a sacrifice so that through faith in him, his death and resurrection becomes the means of forgiveness and a brand new life for us. Secondly, this is the now Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is here with us right now. For the disciples in Emmaus, Jesus was there in his risen body. At that point, he hadn't ascended to the Father and the Holy Spirit had not been given. 
But that's changed. The Holy Spirit has been given and is here right now. So as we take the bread and the wine, we open ourselves up to his presence. We don't need to say anything. We can just rest in the knowledge that he is here. He understands our situations, all of them, and will walk with us through them. Not only is it past, present, but it's also future. Jesus promised never to leave us or forsake us. The new life starts now and goes on into eternity. We don't know how the coronavirus situation will end or any other situation we face come to that, but he does, and he's got it covered. He is our sure hope for the future, and we can rest in that certain knowledge that all things will work out for our good. So, let's be still. Let's relax. Breathe slowly and prepare to meet Jesus through this communion. We begin by together saying sorry to God for all those things we know to be wrong in our lives. Pray together. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor and what we have thought in what we have said and done through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to you. Have mercy on us. Pardon, deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The table of bread and wine is now ready. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more you who have been here often, and you who have not been here for a while, you who have tried to follow Jesus, and you that have failed. Come, it is Jesus who invites us to meet him here. Let us pray together using the words on the screen. Loving God, through your goodness, we have this bread and wine to offer, which the earth has given and human hands have made. May we know your presence in the sharing of this bread, so that we may know your touch, not only through the bread and wine, but in all things. We celebrate the risen life that Jesus has shared among his community through the centuries and shares with us now. Made one in Christ and one with each other, we offer these gifts and with them ourselves, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Amen. So let us now eat together through our next song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord.
They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. 
Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Spring is a time of transformation, a time where we see new life springing up from the ground. But it is just a season. The harsh reality is that autumn will eventually come and the life that we've seen around us will, will die away, only for the cycle to repeat and life to come again the following year. This transformation, however, that Jesus was bringing was going to go way beyond a season. These disciples that had had an encounter with Jesus wasn't just a momentary thing. It was a thing that was going to go beyond this life and into eternity. Jesus, in rising from the dead, was now offering the opportunity for these disciples and for the whole world to experience the same. Life eternal in and through him. These disciples had been mourning. Why were they mourning? They were mourning because they thought that their friend had been swallowed up by death and with it so their hope but as Jesus spent this time with them and opened their eyes to see who he is in fact they realized it was the other way around Jesus had swallowed up death that he in rising from the dead had defeated death he had conquered over the grave he was risen he is risen and that changes everything when we discover something exciting we have to share it with others whether it's we've discovered that our, our child is walking for the first time or they've spoken their first words, we need to tell someone about it. Whether it's we found that a most amazing location to watch the sun go down that's just so picturesque and we want to share it with someone else. Or whether it's we've learned a new skill and we're excited to show someone and teach someone the skill that we've learned. Moments like this that are truly exciting for us, we have to share with someone else. And for these disciples, their eyes had been opened to see that Jesus is who he says he is because he is alive, that he is the saviour of the world. He is their redeemer. And in excitement, they need to tell others. These disciples that once were mourning were now in a place where they couldn't hold back their praise. Their declaration that Jesus is alive, they needed everyone to know. And so on that road that they had been walking on in mourning, now they were running down the road with declaration and shouts of praise at the news of what they have just discovered. Jesus had opened the scriptures to them, helping them to see that they weren't isolated stories. They were one story pointing to who he is. And here he was alive. Now their eyes opened. They were excited to run and tell and share that story with others. But not only the story that Jesus had been sharing with them, but their very own story, their story of their encounter of Jesus and what that meant for them. These were some of the first lives impacted by this Jesus. But we've heard and we've seen throughout all of history, countless lives impacted by this person, Jesus. Of lives transformed in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, the one who conquered over sin and death. We're now going to hear some stories from our own church family of lives which have been impacted by this Jesus, of lives transformed by this Jesus.
that first Easter, Jesus revealed himself to these disciples. And today, Jesus longs to reveal himself to us. Whether we've been walking with him for a number of years, and today is a day where we perhaps open the Bible anew and we see him fresh on the pages in front of us, or whether it's for the very first time. The fact is, for, for these disciples and, and for us as his disciples, he longs to turn our morning into praise. As we recognise that he is the king of the world. Why? Because he conquered sin and death that he is risen. This is what we celebrate as Christians at Easter, that Jesus conquered sin and death, and with it, we enter into life anew, that Jesus truly is the better Moses. He truly is the better David, the better Isaac, the better Jacob, the better, the true and better one. Why? Because he's the saviour of the world. And in us putting our trust in him, we get to enter into a hope eternal. We get to enter into a relationship with the God of the universe. We get to be free from the curse of sin and death. This is the good news. This is the day of celebration, the day in which Jesus became king of the world, the one who extends an invitation for us to come and be part of his family. And so as we come to a close now and we come into a time of response, of celebration as we sing these songs. Let's sing it with praise upon our lips that our Lord and Saviour has done a mighty thing for us. But if you don't know him, let's just take a moment now. Maybe today's the day to come into that relationship with him. Maybe today's the day that you enter from your morning into praise as you see Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. So let's just take a moment now to pause, to be still to take that moment before Jesus and pray. Lord Jesus, we say we believe in you. We believe that you are the one who died and the one who rose again. And now you're the one who's sitting at the right hand of the Father in glory. Lord, we thank you for, for revealing yourself to us through your word. Lord, thank you for the transformation you have brought to our lives. Lord, thank you that in knowing you, we have the greatest hope secured. Lord, help us this Easter to be those who take that good news and like the disciples, with hearts of praise, seek to make you known to the world. Lord, we worship you this morning as the one who has broken the curse of sin and death. The amazing grace that you've extended to us, Jesus. We give you praise, we give you thanks, we give you honour, glory. And Lord, we say that this truly is the happiest day that we get to celebrate what you have done and the life transformational power that means for each one of us. We worship your holy name. Amen. i
sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphans a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be saved.
Lord Jesus, that through our faith in you, we are changed. Help us to continue daily in this process of continual change by keeping our eyes fixed on you, by abiding in you, and constantly being led by the Holy Spirit. In these days of challenge, help us to remember that the events of the first Easter made it possible for a new, forgiven, and redeemed life. That today we have your constant Holy Spirit presence. And in the days to come, we have a hope that is sure, certain, and can never be shaken. Amen. Well, it's been great they've been able to join us today. If you're watching live, please remember you can join a few of us for a chat after the service by clicking the connect button on your screen. But from all of us at BCC, we wish you a wonderful Easter, that you may know the blessings, the love, the joy, the hope, and the rest that only Jesus can give. See you soon. Bless you. Bye.